Gaming crossovers, a concept that has absolutely exploded with popularity in recent years, taking two well-established franchises and mashing them together in order to market towards several communities and possibly get them interested in a new game. And it's so fun to see a game franchise come out and really find an audience and then see who the developer can convince to collab with them. Some of these collabs almost feel like jokes. Like there was a game that released in 1992 for the Super Famicom called Battle Soccer Field No Hasha, but it wasn't any ordinary soccer game, it was a crossover of Godzilla, Gundam, Kamen Rider, and Ultraman. And if you told me that Mario and the Rabbids would not only star in a game together, but that game would be unbelievably fun, I would have called you a liar. And then there's Mr. Beast and Stumble Guys. So to commemorate talking about more gaming crossovers, I brought back a fan favorite. Hey, it's me, the real Spider-Man. Not only am I here to guest star once again on this YouTube channel, but I want to show off my greatest accomplishment ever. Today's video is sponsored by Honkai Star Rail, the multi-platform space fantasy RPG voted best mobile game at the Game Awards. As a trailblazer, you can immerse yourself in different worlds across the universe in your very own space journey, searching for treasure, discovering secrets, and learning all about the world around you. This turn-based adventure has more than 30 playable characters, each with their own unique personality, lore, and of course, movesets. Like the all-new five-star character, Dr. Ratio, a graceful genius with deadly abilities, gaining powerful buffs the more debuffs the enemy has. The new 1.6 update takes you to the space station, introduces a brand new map, seclusion zone, and sees the return of the sought-after Blade and Kafka characters. You'll also get 10 free Star Rail passes when you log in for 7 days, and if you log in starting January 17th, you can get one copy of Dr. Ratio absolutely free, the very first time Honkai Star Rail has given away a 5-star character. Honkai Star Rail is available on PC, PS5, PS5 and mobile devices, and if you download the game and use my special code, you can redeem 50 Stellar Jade. So make sure you download Honkai Star Rail today. A big thank you to them for sponsoring today's video, and let's get back to it. When you think of crossovers, the first thing that probably comes to your mind is fighting games. And honestly, that makes sense. Fighting games constantly have crossovers. Sometimes these collabs are from a third party, but sometimes a company owns plenty of characters to toss into the mix. And then there's fucking Urguys. In the mid-1990s, Squaresoft and Namco came to a licensing agreement that would allow Square to develop games for Namco's arcade systems. Square had previously worked with Dream Factory to create the Tobol fighting game series, so they tapped Dream Factory once again for this all-new IP, Urguys God Bless the Ring. The game was directed by Seiichi Ishii, who was a designer for both Sega's Virtua Fighter and Namco's Tekken, even serving as director for the latter. So unsurprisingly, you can kinda see the DNA of both Virtua Fighter and Tekken in Urguys. This 3D fighter released for arcade systems and later for the PlayStation 1. The game features a whole host of original characters, all developed by Tetsuya Nomura, but being developed by Square, it also included a bunch of characters from Final Fantasy VII, because of course it did. The arcade version of the game featured Cloud and Tifa as guest fighters, though weirdly, these were timed unlocks. Cloud was unlocked 30 days after the initial boot-up of the arcade board, Tifa was unlocked after 60, and then an original character, Django, was after 90 days, so you basically had to wait a full 3 months to unlock the full roster. The console version would later add a few more, along with Cloud and Tifa, Sephiroth, Yuffie, Vincent Valentine, and Zack Fair were all playable characters, though they were mostly just clones of other pre-existing fighters. Also, this game for some reason has the loudest menu sounds of all time. Another fighting game where a company featured their own characters as guests is Clay Fighter 63 and a third, and its special edition, Sculptor's Cut. Interplay Productions developed and published the series, so while they kept some of their original characters from previous Clay Fighters and then came up with a few more, they also brought two of their other characters into the game, Boogerman and Earthworm Jim. Both were stars in 2D platformer games made on older consoles, and kind of appropriately, they also serve as each other's rivals in Clay Fighter. But now let's talk about a game with a wild premise. A Japan-only release for the GameCube, Dream Mix TV World Fighters. After the success of Super Smash Bros., a trio of companies wanted to take a whack at their own crossover platform fighter, but this one is kinda weird. Konami, Hudson, and Takara two game companies, and a toy company of all things. Like, the game companies make sense, but Takara Toys being there is just so out of left field. 
So in this game, you've got hit video game characters fighting alongside Optimus Prime and Beyblade. Like one of these things is truly not like the others. It makes for such a stark contrast. Like seeing Bomberman fight Solid Snake makes sense, but then looking over and seeing Lika-chan, a fashion doll similar to Barbie, is just so funny. Outside of the almost unbelievable nature of its crossovers, the game is kind of forgettable. The controls and attacks are pretty stiff, and while they tried something different for the combat, it just doesn't execute all that well. When you take damage, you drop coins, which can be picked up by other players. When you lose all your coins, you shrink down and your heart pops out. You can get a second chance to continue playing if you collect it, but if an opponent collects it, you are knocked out. But you still get to play around and interfere with the match, you just can't win. Despite this, it's kinda cool that Bomberman, Solid Snake, and Simon Belmont all appeared in a platform fighter together years before Smash Ultimate. Speaking of Nintendo, it's always fun to see who they're willing to play ball with. It feels like they'll go years without doing any kind of collaboration, and then suddenly, bam, they're everywhere. But there is a Nintendo game that was actually a sneaky crossover that I honestly think is super underrated. Mario Hoops 3 on 3. Released in 2006, this was a basketball game developed by, of all companies, Square Enix. This was only their second game developed for Nintendo, with the first being Super Mario RPG a full decade prior. Even knowing this was developed by Square Enix, this game has always felt very Mario, to the point where you think Nintendo developed it in-house. Mario items, coins, all the different courts you can play on with the Mario themes, this game really was a slam dunk. Oh brother, this guy stinks! But like I said, this was a sneaky crossover, because not only can you play as 16 different Mario characters, Square Enix managed to get five Final Fantasy characters into the game as well. Black Mage, White Mage, and Ninja are all jobs that can be chosen for the player characters in the very first Final Fantasy, and Moogle and Cactuar are recurring species in the series. Mario Hoops is actually the very first time that Mario and Final Fantasy have ever crossed over, and it's so weird that it's in this random basketball game. I loved Mario Hoops as a kid. I sunk so many hours into it, and I feel like no one I know has also played this game. However, some people somewhere must have played the game, because it did well enough to get a follow-up. Mario Sports Mix, released for the Wii in 2010, once again developed by Square Enix. While keeping basketball as a sport, they also added in volleyball, dodgeball, and hockey. Funny enough, while I played a ton of hoops, this is a game I actually don't have too much time in. It wasn't really a conscious thing, I just didn't hear about the game too much when it came out. Everyone I know who grew up with it though loves it, and I can see why I had a ton of fun playing it more recently. All of the Final Fantasy characters from Mario Hoops make a comeback in Sports Mix, and we also got one more addition, the slime from the Dragon Quest series. Like Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest games are generally standalone, so instead they use common enemies and themes across each game and the slime quickly became the most iconic enemy, essentially serving as the series' mascot. But this actually isn't the first time Mario and Dragon Quest have crossed over. For that, we need to bust out the board games. 1991 saw the release of a new game from the creator of Dragon Quest, Yuji Horii. Very different from Dragon Quest, this is just a straight-up board game on your Famicom, titled Itadaki Street. Similar to Monopoly, the goal of the game is to purchase property, develop on that property, and earn money from other players landing there. The end goal and things like minigames and stocks make it different from Monopoly, but that's a basic rundown. The series became incredibly popular in Japan, resulting in entries on many different platforms, including home consoles, handhelds, and mobile devices. But you know what I always think is missing when I'm playing classic tabletop games? From the second entry on, Enix picked up the series, which carried on into the Square Enix merger. And thanks to the healthy number of characters Square Enix owns, the fifth entry in the series was a special version of the game, Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy and Itadaki Street Special, combining all three of these series into one big crossover. They also made a PSP version of this game, again featuring Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy. And then June 2007 came along, and a new DS game was released, Itadaki Street DS, which brought together Dragon Quest and the Mario series. This was the second time Nintendo and Square Enix crossed over, following Mario Hoops, and because this was released in 2007, it predates Slime's appearance in Sports Mix, making it the first time ever that Mario and Dragon Quest collaborated. However, the series up to this point never left Japan. But Nintendo, I guess, wanted to take a gamble, because they took responsibility for publishing a sequel on Wii internationally. So, for the first time ever, Itadaki Street left Japan, titled Fortune Street in the US and Boom Street in PAL regions. And for many, this game was their first exposure to Dragon Quest, possibly getting them into the series. And that's what crossovers are all about. 
What are you doing? But we gotta talk about some of the weirdest crossovers in all of gaming, and you might know what game series I'm about to talk about. Mortal Kombat. Back in the day, Mortal Kombat was known as the game where you can rip a guy's head off. Nowadays though, Mortal Kombat is known as the game where you can rip a guy's head off as John Cena. There are just so many weird crossovers in this series. Mortal Kombat 9 featured Kratos exclusively on the PS3 and Freddy f***ing Krueger as guest characters. But Mortal Kombat X really ramped it up with a horror movie lineup. Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th, Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and Alien and Predator. Mortal Kombat 11 saw a similar movie theme, but this time with violent action characters. Spawn, Terminator, Robocop, John Rambo, and the Joker. And now in the current entry, Mortal Kombat 1, we see a gory superhero theme with Omni-Man from Invincible, Homelander from The Boys, and Peacemaker. The way this series has a huge roster of crossovers, you'd think it had always been this way. But really, it hadn't. The success of that trend had everything to do with one really weird game, Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe. The developer of Mortal Kombat, Midway Games, and DC Comics joined forces to create this crossover game instead of what would have been a standard Mortal Kombat entry. It naturally featured characters from both franchises, and it featured an actual story to play through, which was pretty uncommon at the time for a fighting game. While many sang the praises of this game, Midway was not in a good spot, and pretty much right as Mortal Kombat vs. DC released, the company was forced to file for bankruptcy and began selling off their assets, and Warner Brothers ended up buying the studio associated with Mortal Kombat. Warner Brothers also owns the rights to DC characters and games, so there you go. Now they own all of the characters in this game. I guess it sort of worked out though, because under the new ownership, they created NetherRealm Studios, and the Mortal Kombat franchise was soft rebooted, which is also when all of the cool guest characters started showing up. Not only that, but with the assets and experience in NetherRealm, WB could create a whole new fighting game series, Injustice, exclusively for the DC Comics characters. But then that game got some cool crossovers too. The first entry actually saw Mortal Kombat Scorpion, which makes sense, they own that guy. Plus it's a fun callback to Mortal Kombat vs DC. Then the sequel brought two more Mortal Kombat characters, Raiden and Sub-Zero and then Hellboy and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. NetherRealm is really over here just coming up with the coolest ideas for crossovers, and they actually end up working. Another fighting game series with some kinda neat crossovers is Tekken, but it's definitely not to the level of Mortal Kombat. They only have five guest characters across the whole series. Gon the Dinosaur was added as a guest fighter all the way back in Tekken 3, thanks to the popularity of his manga series. After a huge gap, Tekken 7 brought some more guests. Geese Howard from the Fatal Fury series and Noctis from Final Fantasy XV were revealed in the game's first DLC pass. And while they're cool, they aren't too wild because they're both gaming characters after all. But then they put Negan from The Walking Dead in the game. This is just so random. Here's this random cult leader from a zombie TV show. It's just so out there. The base roster for Tekken 7 also featured Akuma from Street Fighter, but this isn't the first time Akuma has appeared alongside Tekken characters. For that, we need to look at Street Fighter Cross Tekken. Capcom and Namco came together to announce a brand new set of crossover fighters using their fighting game properties. Street Fighter Cross Tekken would feature a roster from both series with gameplay in the style of Street Fighter, while Tekken Cross Street Fighter would be a similar crossover, but using the Tekken gameplay. And that is such a cool idea. They're two of the powerhouses of the fighting game genre, so seeing them cross over and create dual mirror games is just sick. And in 2012, we saw the release of the Street Fighter side of the crossover, which was met with a pretty lackluster reaction. The biggest concern with the game was the use of gems, which were paid items that could be equipped to your fighter to give them different attributes or abilities. This was pretty transparently a way to increase revenue for the game, which was apparently extraordinarily expensive. And worst yet, gems simply boiled down to a pay-to-win aspect of the game, which is super lame. It was also discovered that fully completed characters existed on the disc, but they weren't included as a part of the base roster and would instead be paid DLC which definitely didn't help the sour taste that this game gave players. Despite that, the game moved forward with DLC, and it even had some pretty wacky ideas. Both companies implemented two of their classic non-fighting game characters, and they did so in such strange ways. For the Namco side, Pac-Man became a playable fighter, using a giant controllable mech to fight it. And for Capcom's choice, they went with Mega Man, but not just Mega Man, the horrendously ugly bad box art Mega Man that appeared on the North American box art for Mega Man 1. That's like something someone would mod into the game, but nope, it's the official character. Another fun DLC duo that got included is Toro the Sony Cat and his friend Kuro. 
Toro and Kuro basically served as mascots for Sony and the PlayStation at the time. Toro was dressed as and had the moveset of Ryu, while Kuro imitated Kazuya and his moveset. Oh, and just for good measure, they threw in Cole McGrath from the Infamous series. And all of this DLC was exclusive to the PlayStation 3 and Vita versions of the game. The PC and the Xbox versions got nothing. There were negotiations for exclusive characters on Xbox, but nothing ever came from this. And Tekken Cross Street Fighter has never come out. The Tekken director, Katsuhiro Harada, said that development was halted in 2016, and the game was about 30% complete. An official reason has never really been given, though it's possible the failure of Street Fighter Cross Tekken played a big role in its cancellation. But they were actually able to reuse some of the assets when designing Akuma for his appearance in Tekken 7, so not all was lost, I guess. But when it comes to crossovers, there is one king that stands tall above the rest, Ryu. Now, Capcom loves their crossover games. Street Fighter Cross Mega Man, Tatsunoko vs. Capcom, X-Men vs. Street Fighter, Project Cross Zone, Marvel vs. Capcom. <gasps> That's me! But they also love to license out their properties to other projects, especially Ryu. Super Smash Bros., Fortnite, Power Rangers, Minecraft, we love golf! In the film world, there's a concept called the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon an idea that Kevin Bacon appeared in so many films with enough high-profile actors that you can connect any actor back to Kevin Bacon in six moves or less. Well, the same thing has been done with Ryu. There are several accounts online that essentially link Ryu to different characters in the exact same way. Crash Bandicoot appeared alongside Bowser in Skylanders Imaginators, and Bowser and Ryu both appear in Smash for a Ryu number of two. Or there's Elmo from Sesame Street, who has appeared alongside Kermit the Frog. Kermit appears in Disney Heroes Battle Mode with Jack Skellington, and Jack Skellington is in Minecraft with Ryu for a Ryu number of three. You can even do it with real people. Tony Hawk appears alongside Spider-Man in Pro Skater 2, and Spider-Man and Ryu are in many of the Marvel and Capcom crossovers. But recently, you can actually play another fun game. How far away is any piece of media from Fortnite? This incredibly overstimulating chart really puts into perspective how impactful Fortnite has become. Your favorite franchise could only be three or four steps away from getting 90s cranked on it. With so many movies, TV shows, video games, real life people appearing in the game, nothing can escape from Fortnite. And for that reason, you should use creator code Aaron Itmar in the Fortnite item shop. Crossovers are so cool. Bringing all these franchises together, linking all of their universes, you never know what you're gonna get. I mean, Ryu could even show up in this very video. <laughs> 